Oh, my name is Jim Casting. Okay, and Jim, are we alone in the universe? We are not alone. Uh, I'm a fan of Carl Sagan, and I think Carl was right about this. You do? So, okay, so uh, is that based on hope or rationality, or both? It's a combination, but it's mostly hope right now. <laughs> okay. Well, I've heard that you're a, a Trekkie, so you like Star Trek, so does that play any role in your uh, hope? Star Trek's a very uh, optimistic film too, so, or TV series, okay. so, so yes. Anyway, so you, I asked you a question, are we alone? And you said, yes, I kind of hope it. Is that right? I kind of hope it. Yes. All right, so what's this hope based on? Well, there is scientific justification for it. And what is what, your scientific, how do you understand that? What I work on is habitable planets uh, like the Earth and the question of whether there are other habitable planets out there, and I think you can make a pretty credible argument that there should be other habitable planets. And by habitable planets, you mean Earth-like with water in the surface or something? Earth-like, we've talked about that at this workshop we're at in Paris, and uh, you need a planet with a solid or liquid surface to begin with, no gas giants like Jupiter or Saturn. You need carbon because I think all life will be carbon based. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking about finding life on planets around other stars, you need surface liquid water because I don't think you, you need for life to be present at a planet's surface so it can modify the atmosphere in a way we can measure remotely. And I think if it doesn't have, if the planet doesn't have liquid water, we won't recognize the evidence for life. But independent of our ability to recognize it, let's just talk about whether it's there or not. Well, life can be there. I'm interested in testable questions. Mm -hmm. So if there's life on Proxima Centauri B, but we can't test it, then that's, that's sort of like how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. Uh, so that, you know, science is all about testable hypotheses. Presumably you test reasonable hypotheses, not unreasonable ones. Well, you try to formulate reasonable <laughs> hypotheses, but... All right, so anyway, the question, are we alone? You say yes, and your answer, and the reason is because you think that there are a lot of habitable planets in the universe? I'm also optimistic about the chances for originating life. And Why is that? I read a good book by Eric Smith and Harold Morowitz that came out last year called The Origin and Nature of Life on Earth. And they sort of fall into what's called the metabolism first uh, category of origin of life theories. But if you believe that, then anywhere where the conditions are right, meaning you have the right kind of thermodynamic free energy gradients, then life should spontaneously arise. And you believe that? I, I do. I, I would like to believe that, but that's a testable hypothesis. Well, in some sense, we have information on that and that Fermi paradox. If there's life everywhere, then it should, some of it should have gotten intelligent and made spaceships and they would have colonized the galaxy, but they're not here, so we have data that suggests that that's wrong. Right. Yeah, I've, I've learned about the Fermi paradox in the la last few years. Apparently, Fermi didn't believe in this because Fermi didn't believe in the possibility of interstellar spaceflight. But he so was that was his solution. To that was Fermi his paradox. solution. So Fermi had an easy solution uh -huh. to it. There were other people that were colleagues of Fermi, so I think we're having lunch with him at one day, and they they pushed it harder than he did, and and you know Fermi's name got attached to it. There there are reasons you could you could have life be common in the universe and and not have intelligent life or spacefaring life be common. Uh, so there, there's this concept called the great filter, which uh, suggests that there's some very difficult step in between the origin of the formation of habitable planets and the spread of a technological space, spacefaring civilization. There's some step or steps in there that are very difficult, and it's called the great filter. And what do you think is the biggest uh, bottleneck there? Is it the origin of life? It's certainly not the origin of Earth-like planets, but is it the origin of life? Is it the origin of intelligence? Is it the space-faring, things are too far apart, or self-destruction, for example? Right, I lean towards the, the latter uh, mechanism. So, self-destruction, you don't have to do it in a war. You know, our technical civilization could self-destruct if we just simply don't overcome the hurdles that we're running into with overpopulation, with global climate change, 
mean, we're, we're changing the earth and we're populating the earth and draining the resources you know, in ways that are not sustainable. And so you're saying we're doing it so slowly that you might not call it self-destruction, just non-ability to maintain yourself? Yeah, I, that's right. I think that's more of a danger than an all-out nuclear war or something like that. Um, so. Huh. Okay, so if I gave you $100 billion with the caveat that you had to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? Oh, that's easy. I would... Uh, with $100 billion, I could build a really fancy space telescope. And uh, in fact, I don't need $100 billion. I need maybe 10 or $15 billion. And uh, what, the, what we, we, we were working on a telescope, or NASA was working on a telescope like this about 15 years ago. It was called Terrestrial Planet Finder. These days, these, th these telescopes are called direct imaging telescopes. And the idea is you need a big telescope in space, and you, it needs to be specially equipped with, to be able to block out the light from the star and look for reflected light from planets around it. Mm -hmm. And you can do that either with a coronagraph, which is inside the telescope, or with a star shade, which flies externally. But then, you know, th that would be f far superior to the, even the big James Webb, Webb Space Telescope that we'll be sending up in two years, because James Webb can, can't separate the, light from the planet from that of the star. They can only see planets that transit in front of their stars. So it's not a big enough telescope? It's a bit, plenty big. It's six and a half meters. We, we need a minimum of about a four meter telescope. So something James Webb size, or maybe if I have a hundred billion, I'll make it a little bigger. Um, so why isn't James Webb going to be able to do this? James Webb, as I said, it can't separate the light from the planet from the light from the star. And that's so, because it's an infrared, even. It's infrared. It doesn't it have, it has a coronagraph on it, but it's not a good enough coronagraph. In, if you're looking, well, if you're looking in the visible, if you were looking at the, our solar system from some long distance, large distance, the, the Earth is 10 to the 10th times dimmer than the sun. Mm. Uh, so you have to block out the starlight to a factor of 10 to the 10th, and oh. that takes a really good coronagraph. All right, so you're going to make a space, telegraph, a space telescope with 10 or $20 billion. What are you going to do with the rest of the 80? Well, with the rest of the 80, I would, I would save it until we, well, uh, actually there's, there's follow-up missions that you, you can do on this. So the first mission, that NASA wants to do would be in the visible. Then you can do an infrared interferometer. So think of taking four, four James Webb Space Telescopes and fly them in formation. Uh -huh. And then you can get, you can do direct imaging in the infrared and get complementary sets of spectra. That sounds like another 50 billion or something. Yeah, I don't know. Everybody thinks it would be more expensive than the visible. So I'm still within your budget. Okay, so you got, let's say you got 30 more billion dollars. What are you gonna do with the rest? Planetary exploration. Planetary exploration, so Mars, Venus? Mars, uh, actually this, I can spend the whole 100 billion on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> so the okay. best way to find life on Mars is to send astronauts there with mm. deep drilling equipment and mm. drill down a kilometer. Is kilometer, that, okay. Well, that's where I think the life will be if it's there. That deep, not 100 meters, but a kilometer. The kilometer is about where, you know, thermal models of Mars interior predict that you should get to li a liquid water layer down mm -hmm. at about a kilometer Oh, I or thought so. it was more closer to the surface. Maybe in some places. Okay. But, um, All right, so would you spend any money from your 100 billion on getting really good microscopes to look for nano alien spaceships in this room? No, no, I, I, I know this theory. There's a, there's a concept called the shadow biosphere that has been pushed by an astronomer named Paul Davies. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he thinks that and they're- And Charlie Landry. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> there were two authors on the paper. <laughs> oh, okay, so I'm, I'm treading into dangerous ground here. <laughs> no, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so, so the argument is that there could be a second form of life present here on Earth that we don't recognize. See, I, I think that's unlikely because, not because it couldn't be there and we wouldn't recognize it, it's just because life evolved, all the life that we know 
comes from a common ancestor that we call Luca, the last universal common ancestor. And I think Luca was so successful, basically, that it outcompeted these alternative forms. But I, but I was asking more about alien nano spaceship, you know, advanced technology from another planet that has, you know how we're making micro versions of everything, we're getting smaller and smaller. Well, why couldn't a really advanced civilization uh, make tiny nanoscale spaceships that you could find with a, teles with a microscope? Uh, I, I, I'm not that big of a believer in nanotechnology. Okay. You know, there, there is a, <coughs> a mission called Project Starshot that mm. is being, maybe being funded by a, a billionaire out in San Francisco where the, the plan is to send nano spacecraft to Alpha Centauri, mm -hmm. ex, uh, accelerating, accelerating them with a giant laser beam from the Earth. And I actually went to one of the, their meetings and heard some talks on this, and I, I'm not convinced they can actually do that. Oh, so you didn't believe Phil Leuven, huh? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, how about, you know, you have a brain, and in your brain you have neurons. And those neurons, any particular neuron, does not know it's inside of your brain, presumably. Now, do you think that that could be analogous to our situation? Could we be inside of an alien? No, there, there are things that happen at different scales, and I don't think that you can scale everything up like that. Uh, so you think we're pretty sure we're not inside of an alien? That's right. No, I, th I think life is a phenomena that happens at a particular size scale, which happens to be us and things down to microbe size. Oh, so how about the Gaia hypothesis? Are you a big fan of that or not? I, I, I've thought a lot about the Gaia hypothesis. I used to argue sometimes with Jim Lovelick and Lynn Margulis. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's poetic, but I, I don't think a planet is really alive except a, as a poetic way of thinking about it. In the question, are we alone? You answered, yes, I kind of hope. What did you understand by the word we? We, to, to, to me, means is there life out there? I mean, there, there's. There's at least two fundamental questions. One is, is there life off the earth? And the, the other, which I think more people are interested in, is, is there intelligent life off the earth? I'm, I, I'm optimistic about both, but I'm most optimistic about simple life because, because I think, back to the great filter, I think the great filter is ahead of us, not behind us. So I, I agree with Carl Sagan that you know, life, habitable planets should be widespread, the origin of life, I think Carl would have argued, was relative, not that uncommon of, a, of an event. And so getting up to simple life, I think, will happen frequently. Well, if you think the, fil the bottleneck is ahead of us, then Nick Bostrom has written an article about this saying, if we find independently evolved life on Mars, that would be the worst, ev worst headline ever. That would be the worst news we have ever received. Why? Because that means the bottleneck is ahead of That's us. That's right. And uh, so, so you are very, very pessimistic. Do you share that pessimism? Do you think it would be terrible if we found life independently evolved life on Mars? Actually, you know, I read one of Bostrom's articles. I think it was entitled The Great Filter. Uh -huh. uh, so he's, he's one of the champions of that concept. Yeah. Yes, and I know. It changed my whole viewpoint. I thought I was an optimist because I, <laughs> I and then you liked realized. Carl Sagan. And then I realized after reading that article that I'm actually a pessimist. <laughs> Okay, um, in, so are we alone? We talk about we, so we could be two things. One is all life, but you know, we don't really know what life is, so what do you mean by life? Like viruses, are viruses alive in your world? It doesn't matter in my world. Uh, viruses are, I think there's a continuum between life and non-life, and viruses are somewhere on that continuum. So They're, then the question, are we alone, is kind of, kind of very ambiguous. Well, but... Uh, very well defined. But there's, there's things that are definitely not alive, like rocks, mm -hmm. and uh, things that are definitely alive, like people and microbes, and, and, and viruses are in between. Uh, I think that life does self-organize. We, we're at this Origin Life workshop here in Paris, and, and there's disputes about how that whole origins problem works. I mean, there is no agreement on that. All right, how about the question, uh, alone? Are we alone? There's another word, alone. Now, if I walk out of this room, will you be in here alone? I, 
think it goes back to the question of testability or detectability. So, so what I'm interested in, the life question, and if, if there's nobody there in the room, then in some sense, you know, it's, you're not detectable. Uh, I'm not sure that's a good analogy, but that, I'm not interested in, in life out there on other planets that we can't possibly detect. I'm interested in... Right, but I was more interested in, some people think that if we detect life on Mars, microbes, that we will still be alone because it's not intelligent life with, with whom we can talk. Oh. And some people think, oh, I'd still be alone. But is, that, is your view like that as well? It's, 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 two, it's two separate bo questions, both interesting. And see, I, I guess I'm more interested in the life question because during my lifetime, especially, but during, probably during both of our lifetimes, much easier to test that hypothesis than the, the intelligent life hypothesis. Unless we get some signals from them tomorrow from SETI. I, I'm all for these people that uh, spend their time and energy doing SETI, but you know, that's, that's a tougher search than the one that we're talking about. Well, some of these SETI researchers are trying to, uh, it seems to me, I, I sometimes accuse them of looking for God because they're looking for an alien civilization that's uh, so, it's going to be super advanced and they would know everything. And I say, well, aren't you looking for God? What do you think of that accusation? No, we're actually, with SETI, the SETI searches that I'm familiar with, we're looking for something, some civilization that isn't that different from our own because we, actually, you know, if you go out, we, we can only eavesdrop out to something like 50 light years right now. And beyond that, we can only detect a civilization if they're actively beaming radio waves or laser light at us from some distance. That's why I think it's a very, you know, there's a very small chance that somebody's actually doing that. Um, and there's also a relatively small chance that there's a detectable civilization within 50 light years that, uh, that we can eavesdrop on. So that means that your favorite solution to the Fermi paradox is probably just distance, and the difficulty of interstellar travel between two independently evolved civilizations? Well, that's, that's right, and, and the difficulty of detecting an intelligent civilization. See, it's much easier to detect simple life. Really? Yes. Why do you say that? Well, because to de detect an intelligent civilization right now, if they're beyond 50 light years, they have to be beaming energy, okay. focused energy at us in the form of radio waves or, or light waves. Couldn't they have been, couldn't, wouldn't they necessarily have also changed the atmospheric content that would make them then detectable in the same way that simple life would be detectable? They, I think they would actually, if you had intelligent aliens, they, they, would, they would be living on a planet with an O2-rich atmosphere. So, so I think, yes. But you don't have to have intelligent aliens to have planets with O2-rich atmospheres. <laughs> you just need cyanobacteria or the alien equivalent thereof. Okay. Do you think the question, are we alone, is an important question? Oh, I think it's tremendously important. And... Uh, you know, I'm not the most eloquent in expressing this, but my friend Sarah Seeger at MIT is very eloquent. And she, you know, when she gives talks on this, including to Congress, um, you know, congressional uh, panels, she, she describes this as, you know, the, we're looking, for, if there was a discovery of life off the earth, she, she describes that as the second Copernican revolution. The first one being discovery, uh, Copernicus and Galileo, teaming up to figure out that the earth was going around the sun rather than vice versa, which changed our whole perception of where we stand in the solar system and in the galaxy. But I think, I think it would be equally uh, momentous to find out that we're not the only form of life in the whole universe. So if we found that out, that's, it's important to find out whether you're alone or not, you think? Is that the idea? Well, I think it is. I think we're all looking for a search for our place in the universe. This is why people for the last 30 or 40 years have been fascinated by cosmology because we're all interested in the question of where the universe comes from. And that's, that's been eminently testable. We now have 30 years of observations and successful space missions you know, in supporting the Big Bang Theory which is, you know, that's been wonderful. And um, we, we can now, I hope we do the same thing with the search for life. Huh. So you're saying that the more we humans find out about our place in the universe, then it's, that's really important to find out who we are? 
Is that what you I mean? think so, you know, so I... I but, but a lot of people couldn't care less about astrobiology or our place. They just care what's for dinner and what the music is and... Yeah, uh, so there's people that think about these things and people that don't, and I guess I, I mostly relate to people that think about these questions. Okay, and so the unexamined life is not worth living? That's right. But you know, <laughs> Star Trek is fun and that's all about this question. You know, that's, mm. that's people, you know, they, the Enterprise runs into alien civilizations and you get all these existential questions about how mm -hmm. civilizations interact. So, so part of this is trying to have a scientific understanding of, how it's, I guess, re, to replace some of the supernatural, more religious versions of how we got here. So we're developing this scientific story of Genesis. Is that how you view it? Is that? Yeah, I'm not anti-religion, but I, you know, I'm trained as a scientist and, and uh, scientists like testable hypotheses. Religion, almost by definition, is, involves some untestable parts, some, some things, you know, faith is a big element, certainly of the Christian religion, and I think of other religions as well, but faith is basically believing in things that you can't test. Um, but surely as we get better and better at the scientific story of Genesis, that displaces more traditional religious views of that. Well, see, I, I personally view that as an advance. Uh, <laughs> so so if, you, if things are testable, then you should test them. Let's talk about what you think life is. You, I asked, are we alone? And, I, and you assumed that there was a, something called life that's meaningful. And then you said, some things are alive, some things are not alive, and then there's everything in between. Uh, how do you measure something like that? Uh, you know, this came up at the workshop and one of the speakers put up multiple definitions, finishing up with what's often called the NASA definition of life uh -huh. and uh, a self-sustaining chemical system capable of an undergoing Darwinian evolution. I, I think that's as good of a def definition as I've heard. Uh -huh. And so memes are not life forms because they're not chemical systems? They're not chemical. So this, this rules out artificial, you know, completely artificial intelligence. Com uh, and, how, yeah. and how about viruses? I asked you about viruses and you said you're not interested in that question. Viruses are not self-sustaining. They're, they're uh, dependent on bacteria or uh, yeah. other life forms, cellular life. Do you think you're self-sustaining? Well, okay, that's fair fair comeback, so we, <laughs> I'm dependent on a lot of other things. Yes, you too. are, and I don't know a life form that isn't. Yeah, so. So that's why I, I, when I hear that word self-sustaining, I kind of wince and say, that doesn't mean much. Well, but you know, my counter to that is life is a continuum. The, there's a continuum between non-life and life, and viruses are on that continuum somewhere. Okay. Um, so you don't, you're not that bothered then to have a good definition of life, to have a mathematical or precise definition then, is that right? Well, that's right. And, you know, partly goes back to, I'm most interested in the search for life on exoplanets, planets outside the solar system. We're not going to actually see life that way. What we're going to, what we hope to see is the metabolic byproducts of life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would argue that, you know, if you, if you start with a planet with water on its surface like the earth and maybe CO2 and nitrogen in its atmosphere, the metabolic products of life are gonna be the same metabolic products that life on earth produces. Now, a lot of biologists talk about how life, a lot of them feel that life is getting more complex. And I think some geologists like Rob Hazen think that geology is getting more complex, more and more minerals with time. Now you do atmosphere studies. Do you think atmospheres get more complex with time? They get complex in one big step, which was talked about here. When you get the rise of oxygen, which is a bio, you know, forced by biology, then atmospheric chemistry becomes more complex because you have sources of reduced gases at the, at the Earth's surface, some of which are natural from volcanoes, some of which are biological. And then you get all these reduced gases getting oxidized in the atmosphere, and that does give you more complex chemistry. Um, but if I showed you a, a atmospheric composition of a bunch of planets, could you put them in any order of time? Like here's the early one, here's the next one, and here's, a, here's an older one? Oh yes, I mean that's what I work on. Okay, so, so uh, then, then there are, then atmospheres do 
evolve? Would you use that uh, word? I, that's, uh, you know, that's my main home field is atmospheric evolution. And atmospheres do evolve. If you, I'm asking for a directionality to that. Like biologists say, to be more complex, you have not said atmospheres get more complex. One of the, great, one of the steps uh, that's listed as a potential difficult step for the great filter argument is the rise of oxygen. Mm -hmm because that, as you well know, it requires the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis by cyanobacteria in Earth's case. And that, that doesn't sound like an atmospheric thing, it sounds like a biological it thing. It is biological and you know. So what's the probability of cyanobacteria or oxygenic photosynthesis arising elsewhere in other Well, we, we don't know, you can't calculate that because what we do think we know is it only happened once on Earth. Uh, it was in, in, oxygenic photosynthesis was invented by the cyanobacteria and then spread to eukaryotes, yes, yes. including higher plants, by endosymbiosis. So it's hard to predict the probability of something that's only happened once. That's right. Uh, and so there you, it becomes philosophical. And I, I think that uh, if you have planets that have st relatively stable climates for several billion years as we have on Earth, then I think photosynthesis will, will get invented, oxygenic photosynthesis will get invented. Um, on other planets? On other planets. But wait, didn't you just tell me you, didn't, you couldn't predict the probability of this because uh, it's a biological thing? I saw, uh, yeah, I said that's, this is where you get into philosophy and uh, outlook. But see, it's wait, testable. Wait, wait, that's not philosophy. It's a logic. So, hey, if something evolved only once, then it's could, it could very well be unique, and therefore you can't talk about its probability. And then you say, oh, we expect it to be elsewhere. I don't understand. Well, it's sort of like the origin of life. We don't understand how that happened, but it, it happened. And I, that is still a philosophical point that, uh, you know, I think that life originates fairly frequently on the, under the right conditions. I think that uh, oxygenic photosynthesis arises fairly frequently. Both of those we hope to be able to test with these big space-based telescopes. Okay. So what, 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 you, what you really need is a survey, a statistical survey of Earth-like planets or rocky planets in the habitable zones of nearby stars. And if you gave me 30 Earths and uh, you know, 10 of them showed signs of life, then I would say the chances are 30%. Okay. All right. Now, some people, many physicists who don't know much about biology, think that once you have life, you'll have intelligent life. And uh, therefore, they think that we should stop looking for life around wet balls on the surfaces of planets, but we should try to look for, you know, spaceships that are uh, silicon life or, you know, computer-based life. These are the types of things that an advanced civilization would spread out all over the universe, making all kinds of measurements. And uh, Martin Rees, for example, is some, belongs to this camp. You don't belong to that camp. No, I'm more, more with Fermi, actually. I, I think interstellar space travel is difficult for reasons that have something. There, there is a great filter somewhere, I think, in our future. And so if we hope to colonize the galaxy ourselves, we, there's some difficult steps we, we have to make it through. And do you think that has to do with rocket propulsion? Yeah, well, you need more than just rocket propulsion to, to do that. Uh, you, you need, we need to stabilize our own pl home planet first, and, and that has to be done long before you can expand off so, of it. By stabilize, you mean make sure that we continue to survive. That's right. So, so Arthur C. Clarke said, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic. But there's a Canadian philosopher who you might know, his name is Carl Schroeder. He said, Carl, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. In other words, I guess you get more ecologically minded and you become more of a tree hugging civilization and then you don't make parking lots, but rather your existence is, I guess you have a slow population, a small population consistent with rainforests all over your planet and therefore you're a really bad emitter of SETI detectable signals. What do you think of that? Uh... I think there's actually a lot to be said for that idea. And in fact, you know, I, I've, I've seen, I don't know that particular author, but I've seen other authors say that our own civilization is going to, within the next 50 years, could become much less detectable than it is. Because for instance, we don't get most of our radio and TV from broad, 
broadcast signals anymore, we get it over cable. And so as, as things get more fiber, fiber optic, and uh, we, we may emit less information rather than more. Now Stephen Hawking was asked about whether we should send signals to outer space, and he said, no, we should keep our head down. And I guess he was looking at human history and saw how, you know, when you have an advanced civilization, a less advanced, they do, you get genocide and lots of killing. And he didn't want us to be on the receiving end of that genocide. And so he thought we should keep our head down. What is your view? You know, I got curious about that myself. And I got, there is a group called METI, mm -hmm. the Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence. The, the nominal leader is this guy named Doug Bukoc. Bukoc. So they, uh, they invited me to one of their meetings uh, in St. Louis a year and a half ago, I, so I went because I mostly wanted to educate myself on that. And it turns out there's, there's arguments on both sides. So, so the, the scary argument is the one that Stephen Hawking adopted that we're gonna advertise ourselves and then the bad aliens will come get us. Mm -hmm. The flip side of that, which I think Doug would advocate is that there is this great filter ahead of us and we, we can benefit ourselves by getting in touch with civilizations oh, that save have, us then. That, that are, so we can save ourselves through this. Well, wait a minute. One of the, Carl Sagan's most famous quotes is, there's no one out there that's going to save us from ourselves, I think. Well, okay. So maybe Carl <laughs> wouldn't buy that argument. I, 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 I hadn't thought of that, actually, till I went to that particular meeting. And so you can make an argument that that it's a good thing and not mm -hmm. a dangerous like thing. Right, those rescues, like, hey, it's like an SOS. Please help us. We're all <laughs> alone here. We're going to kill ourselves if you don't come and rescue us. How about Weddy? Have you heard of Weddy? I have not heard of Weddy. Weddy's Wedi. waiting for extraterrestrial intelligence. You don't search. You don't look. You just wait. I guess that's kind of like just stay alive that's and so don't put bright. much money into it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, in astrobiology, there's an idea that if you look around at the biological the biosphere, and you see some aspect of life that has evolved multiple times independently, then that aspect becomes a good candidate for what you should expect elsewhere. Do you agree with that? Yes. I mean, there, there are certain things. That you get into these arguments with creationists. So one of the old creationists, are, I don't do this myself very often, but uh, one of the old creationist arguments, I think, what had to do with the eye, that uh, the eye is so complicated, how could it have, it have evolved? But then, I forget who, who was the biologist that rebutted that. The eye, there's very good evidence that the eye has evolved at least 20 different times independently on Earth. So it's, it's obviously a e relatively easy evolutionary. Uh, so we should expect aliens to have eyes. Then. They will have eyes, right? Because do plants uh, have eyes? Not that. Not to do my. Fungi have eyes? No, but animals. Eyes. Animals. So you're saying that animals? Should, we should expect animals on other planets then? Yes. Now, not you all sure animals on Earth have eyes, but most of them do. <laughs> How about even more fundamental? Are heads? but heads only evolve once, and usually you can't have an eye without a head. So if the multiply originated thing depends on a single origin thing, then you have a problem. Well, brains though, see, your, your brain is in your head. That's mostly why, why your head is important. I think brains, I mean, brains evolve in all, all animals, right? They just have different sizes and levels of complexity. Well, sponges don't have brains, right? All right, so you can counter, <laughs> contradicted me, <Okay>. but <laughs> well, <laughs> many animals have brains. Yes. And you, you know, the question about intelligence, I, th I think that's like life. I think it's a continuum. Um, so do you think, well, let's talk about it. So let's say, there's the, let's say that the universe is filled with Earth-like planets with life on them, simple life. Or do you think that would then evolve into what you might call intelligent life? I do. I'm, I'm an optimist like Carl Sagan on that because, you know, like, some people think of uh, humans as the only intelligent species on Earth, but I know a lot of scientists who don't think that. I, I met the, one of the people I met, I think it was at this METI meeting, was a woman who studies orcas, the killer whales, and you know, they're actually very intelligent. They haven't developed a technical civilization, but you know, that, that's independent uh, evidence for the evolution of a pretty high level of intelligence on the Earth. 
But let me push back on that and say that the common ancestor between orcas and humans, for example, is about 95 or 100 million years. And 100 million years ago, that common ancestor had a brain. And so what you then have is just a developmental reg gene regulation that says, okay, make this organ big. And if you only have a few knob knobs like that, then you're going to get that. But, it's, but you already have something that's easily evolvable into a big brain in the common ancestor, and therefore it's not an independently evolved creature. Right, but, but you can make an analogy to the eye. I, mean, I, don't, I don't get the same thing with eye. We go eye, bad eye, octopus eye, you go back, you have the same biochemistry in the common ancestor, and therefore you just go, you know, do this and do this and do this, and say, ah, oh, it's independent, just because you've defined it in a rather ornate, specific way, rather than just concentrate on the biochemistry, which is the same and has been the same in the common ancestor. There is a big uh, evolutionary advantage, survival advantage, if you have a good brain and are able to use it. It's not clear that we always satisfy both. It's a good survival advantage to speak English too, but you wouldn't argue that it's a convergent feature of evolution in the universe. No. Well, so it doesn't, the dinosaurs dominated the earth for 150 million years without ever evolving a human level of in intelligence. And so they, in, in that sense, they were, may have been an evolutionary dead end and we're, we're lucky that the asteroid hit and wiped them out. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. So what, no, let's, let me talk to the emotional side of gym casting. You're supposed to close your eyes, <laughs> take a deep breath, and now I'm going to ask you, what kind of alien would you like to find? Well, I like the aliens on Star Trek. They're, uh, <laughs> the, the science fiction authors are way ahead of us. And, okay. Well, they're kind of interestingly dangerous and kind of weird, right? Yeah, in fact, you know, I. Before, long before Star Trek came along, I, I read a lot of science fiction, Asimov and Heinlein, all mm -hmm. the uh, famous old authors, and you know, there's all sorts of speculation. I also read a, a very scary book uh, called The Moat in, in God's Eye by, uh, oh, who, who, who are the authors? I've forgotten now. But the Moat in God's the, Eye. The Moat in God's Eye. Is that what we're saying? Larry Niven and right. Jerry P Pornell, oh. who wrote a number of science fiction books but this was their classic, and they had the astronomers on Earth were looking at some nearby star, uh -huh. and it, it had a little black dot in the middle of it, uh -huh. and then they kept gazing at it, and the black dot got bigger with time. Uh -huh. Well, that turned out to be a big solar sail and uh, uh -huh. attached to an alien spacecraft, which was being <laughs> propelled by a laser from uh -huh. this. And then when they got to the, our solar system, they, they got out of their spacecraft and uh, they were really nasty. They were nasty, so they killed all humans or something? Oh, there, were, there was a big war. I can't remember how it came out. So you seem to be motivated in your science by some of the science fiction that you watch on TV and read in books. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So my f favorite author was Isaac Asimov, oh. actually, who was brilliant, and especially his early work. So the Foundation series and the Robot series, and um, so I love that stuff. Okay. <laughs> and your favorite alien movie? Oh, that, that's uh, Blade Runner. Blade but, Runner. Yeah. How about con you've seen Contact though? You've seen the movie Contact. Contact. With Carl Sagan and, and you know. Kind yes, of like I have. So. Okay. In that movie, three times during that movie, the main character is asked or told, "Well, are we alone in the universe?" And the answer is, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. Yeah. What do you think of that comment? I philosophically agree with it. So I, you know, I, that book was written by Carl Sagan and, you know, Jodie Foster played Jill Tarter in that and, mm -hmm. and it was very well done. Yeah, so that resonated with me. But I'm asking about the specific comment though. Well, that's right. It would I be mean, an awful waste of space if we were alone. That's right, so that's a philosophical opinion. Why would you need, you know, not just a whole galaxy, but a whole universe full of galaxies to support one single sentient species here on Earth? So, um, but that's kind of like a teleological argument, arguing that, hey, the purpose of the universe is to have somebody in it. That's very teleological, and right? And you're happy uh, with your, that teleology. Yeah, well, I... I feel a little guilty about it, but it's okay. <laughs> Right now, it's not that testable, but, uh, mm -hmm. but we, can, we can begin to test it by looking just for the, the first real step is to find li life off the earth. Right, no, I agree with the test. We're all both scientists, but what the, the question is, 
how do you feel about this ethical issue of if the universe, if it would be a waste of space if there aren't more intelligent aliens out there? Yeah, but maybe maybe uh, space is wasted. So it's <laughs> <laughs> space is wasted. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever seen a UFO? I have not seen a UFO. Have you ever been abducted by an alien? I have not been abducted. What do you know about aliens? I, I know what I've read in science fiction books, <laughs> and the, there are different opinions about aliens. So you've probably been approached by people who have seen UFOs and who told you about them. Well, not directly, but there is this report in the news right now from these two to a Har uh, Harvard professor and his student about, is it Uu Mama? Uh, Uu Mua Mua. Mua yeah. the, this, this asteroid that evidently came from outside the solar system because it's on a hyperbolic orbit and it's, it's got a 10 to one aspect ratio and they've written a paper, which I haven't read, but suggesting that it's an alien artifact coming mm -hmm. through here. I don't, I don't think, I don't believe that. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see now. Do, 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 do. That goes back to something that Carl Sagan is famous for saying to, too, although I don't think he invented it. Extraordinary cl claims require extraordinary evidence. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what do you think are the public's or your students' biggest misconceptions about the question, are we alone? Well, I, I would say the biggest misconception is that people are more interested, they're, they're focused on the search for intelligent life, on SETI, and they, most people haven't thought very seriously about how to detect simple life. Um, but, but you said that you, you're fairly sure, or you suggest, you, you think that once there's life, it will become intelligent. But that, it took, four billion years in the case of the Earth, so it doesn't become intelligent overnight. Yes, but um, the average age of, a, of an Earth-like planet in, this, in the universe or in the galaxy is like two billion years older. Okay, you know Earth. that, but that's counting M stars, right, so? Uh, no, no, it, 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 or just G or just K, it doesn't matter. Okay, you've worked on this. Yes, so. I have, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it, but but every, I think most, most astron you ask any astronomer, they'll agree that uh, that the average Earth uh, is, is older than, uh, significantly older than the Earth, and that means two billion years of evolution, and that means there's time on more time, two billion years longer on these other Earths to evolve into intelligence than here. And so uh, lack of time can't, can't be the answer to the Fermi paradox, it seems to me. Probably not, but... Uh... You get into these questions that we, you know, the great filter type questions. Mm -hmm. The or, the uh, or, I, I think you can't have intelligent life without oxygen. You, you can't develop complex, big animals like ourselves without uh, aerobic respiration. And so, if we don't understand, you know, maybe oxygenic photosynthesis was a, a total accident. Um, and, and in that case, you could have lots of worlds with simple life and none with uh, advanced animal life. But I ask you, what was the common, most common misconception? You think the common misconception is that people are constant, are most interested in intelligent life? Is that, is that what you I saying? think most people just haven't thought, thought about the problem of remote life detection. The, you know, maybe the second most common misconception would be that you have to actually find the life as, for example, by going to Mars and bringing back a sample with things crawling around in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that is what you would want to do in our own solar system, yes. but, but that's not possible on exoplanets unless we invent interstellar travel. And you don't think it, you need to do that then? No, I think you can, you can make some pretty strong arguments based on planetary spectra. And you know, that's what we're really most interested in. Okay, do you have any advice for students or any other person who's thinking about becoming an astrobiologist? The best advice to students is to, first of all, what we tell all, all our graduate students, you've got to be well-grounded in some discipline, you know, not just astrobiology, because astrobiology, as you know, it, it actually combines a little bit of just about every sci physical and biological science. So you have to get good at something so you can make a contribution, but then you want to broaden yourself so, because the, 
to me, the thing that we really gain by going to these astrobiology meetings is we find out what problems are of interest to people in other fields. And then you, you think about whether the expertise that you bring with you from your own field might be applied to some of that. Um, or whether there are problems that you could solve within your own discipline that would bear on some of these other questions. So I have a student back here who would like to uh, become an astrobiologist, and I guess he'd like to study under you as a PhD project in trying to figure out how am I gonna look through at a spectra of an exoplanet's atmosphere and determine if there's life there or not. So what, what, what the, how can you fill in the details there? What, what, what go, study with, go study with Vicki Meadows out at <laughs> University of Washington. That's exactly what her Astrobiology Institute group has been doing for the last 15 years or more. And they've actually gotten really good at it. They have good computer codes and lots of young people have been trained there and they, they know pretty well how to answer that question. Okay, and uh, are we alone in the universe? We are not alone. There's, there's life out there. I think there's intelligent life out there and I'm just hoping that during our lifetimes we'll find evidence for that. And not be killed by them. And not be, <laughs> not be killed. I, I'm hoping just, I'd be quite satisfied just to find evidence for simple life off the earth. I think that would be a, an amazing discovery.